Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, Catherine, John, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour to be with you tonight. Um, Catherine said a lot in the introduction, which saves me in terms of re uh, repeating, but um, I have a love for the nature of Ackle Island, um, for the nature of Ireland, and of course for Europe, and I've been very fortunate to spend my career working for the protection, conservation, and restoration of the important areas that we have established across the European Union. I spent 30 years in Brussels, working with many wonderful colleagues across 28 countries, unfortunately now 27, colleagues from Germany, from Ireland, from everywhere, to try and cooperate. And I'd like to share today something about the Natura 2000 network, which is one of the great achievements of cooperation between European countries in terms of safeguarding nature. It's still a work in progress. I'd like to say something about the special places on Ackle Island in the marine and on land, which many of you may not even be aware of in terms of what you have in terms of the special values. I'll take you through the year in terms of the valley and say some of the experiences I had when I came back to live in Ireland, I was out more often. Some of you may see this strange person walking around with their camera because I try and capture the beauty of the nature. So it's Friday night, I know you're all tired, so this will not be a heavy policy talk. I will try and celebrate the nature through the images that I've captured. <coughs> I'll also talk about the conservation challenges because there are real pressures on nature in Ackle. And unfortunately, the nature that Heinrich Boll would have seen in the 50s when he came here, much of that has disappeared. And I think we have to acknowledge that because there's a huge challenge of restoration in relation to nature on Ackle and elsewhere throughout Europe. And I'd like to mention, by way of conclusion, that there are some real opportunities to work together with farmers, with local communities, in terms of conserving nature. Oops. I think when most people come to Ackle, myself, I've been coming here for over 40 years, they're struck by the extraordinary landscape the power of the sea that has shaped this coastline, as you see from the wild Atlantic way, um, the actual ancient rocks that are 700 million years old in terms of the old, some of the oldest rocks in Ireland, the shape of the ice age, the last ice age, which was 10,000 years ago, has left its legacy in terms of the Corrie Lakes, in terms of the wonderful landscape at the western end of the island. And of course, many of us derive great pleasure from walking the beach at Kiel or at Keen, and the Minon Cliffs lit up by the evening sun setting in the west is one of the beauties of Ackle Island. So there really is great beauty in the landscape. I wonder what the first settlers on Ackle would have seen. You know, we, there's a record going back probably four, 6,000 years in terms of the first farmers that came to Ackle looking out from the megalithic tomb from Schlieve Moor out over Kiel. And I guess they probably saw a completely different landscape. It was probably a forested landscape. And over time, that landscape has been changed. Man has had a huge influence in terms of the shape of nature on Ackle and everywhere else. Obviously, the bogs have grown. It may be climate. It's probably a combination of human use of the landscape and climate that has transformed Ackle, which is largely a peat-covered landscape, um, but that in its own sense has huge value. In terms of the nature of Ackle, 
it has been probably described since the beginning of the 20th century, most notably by the most extraordinary naturalist that Ireland ever had, Robert Lloyd Prager, who visited the area in the early 20th century and described the flora, the rich flora that you would find throughout the island. Species like St. Patrick's cabbage, species like the Irish heath. So this documented for the first time, and I, I know that Sean Lyson, I don't know if he's here with us tonight, but he has written a lovely biography of uh, uh, Robert Lloyd Prager, who also was instrumental in the greatest survey that was ever carried out in Britain, Ireland, of the Clare Island nearby, which also covered Ackle Island in terms of birds and other wildlife. So we, we already knew there was value in the landscape, and he, of course, captured the essence of Ackle in terms of the way that I went, his memoir, biography, in terms of his experience of nature, describing it as windswept, bare, heavily peat-covered, great gaunt mountains rising here and there, and a wild coast hammered by the Atlantic waves on all sides but the east. It has a strange charm, which everyone feels, but none can fully explain. And I think that captures, in some sense, the essence, even today, of Ackle Island. Now, my professional interest in Ackle was very much linked to my work in Brussels over 30 years on working with colleagues, working with Ireland and Germany and all the other countries in setting up a network of conservation areas, the most important areas for biodiversity that were identified as being of European interest. This is called Natura 2000. It's based on two EU laws, one for the conservation of wild birds, and that came from 1979 when it was recognized that this was a shared natural heritage of all European countries. And we achieved so much more by working together and cooperating in terms of ensuring their conservation. In 1992, this was broadened out to other habitats and species that were considered to be of European conservation concern. And at the core of this was to protect the most important areas. And really, it's an extraordinary achievement to have almost one-fifth of the land protected in this network, one-tenth of the marine, and it's not only about nature reserves and national parks, they form part of it as well, but most of this land is privately owned. So it means working with farmers, foresters, fishers to try and achieve conservation while at the same time having sustainable livelihoods. It's still a work in progress because the network has been largely established. There's some work still for the marine. But as we say, we don't want paper parks. We want something that's real, meaningful, well-managed, and in many cases it requires restoration to make that the real nature potential of these areas is realized. And unfortunately, we still have a huge amount of work to do in Ireland and in Germany to really realize this full potential for nature and people. Now, looking at Natura 2000 on Ackle Island, you can see that very significant parts of the island are included in this network of conservation areas, both in the marine environment, but also extending very largely over the upland areas, particularly um, on the island. I'd like to say a little bit about those areas. There are also two what we call natural heritage areas, which are nationally designated on areas on the island for the peatlands. I won't cover them because I will focus on the European areas, but to realize that Ackle has high biodiversity value and potential. Now, firstly, around the coast from Duiga Head, right out to Ackle Head and around um, by the cliffs to the far end of the island. There is an extraordinarily rich marine environment. Um, all these photographs are mine, so unfortunately I don't specialize, specialize in underwater photography, otherwise I would share with you 
the extraordinary riches of the sponges, the sea cucumbers, the brachiopods, all the different reefs, these habitats that are actually living in a very high energy environment, a marine environment, but this is a very important marine area in the European context. You can see it in terms of the sandy bay, the inlets at Kiel, Kiel. When the tide is out, you can see these little birds, these sanderlings running in and out of the tide, which shows the kind of riches that are actually beneath, because they're feasting on little sand toppers in, in, in the sand. You will see these sea barnacles sometimes washed in, which reflect, again, the marine life. But most, mostly people will see the mammals, the birds, the seabirds that frequent these areas, such as these common seals that you find around the coast that actually have their pups in Black Sod Bay. Also the grey seals, a larger seal that you'll get on the wilder Atlantic coasts, and you get them around the far side of the island and out on the Inish Keys. And of course, one of the wonderful jewels of Ackles' nature, natural heritage, is Keem. The waters of Keem attract the basking sharks. If we go out there tomorrow, you would see that the basking sharks on a sunny day when the plankton rise, you have these wonderful sightings of the second largest fish on the planet. And they come in, there can be groups of up to 20 or 30 basking sharks in around Ackle at this time of, of the year, reflecting the marine life, the rich plankton that is there. And this bird that you see beside it is the gannet. It's the largest seabird that we have in Europe, and it's dwarfed in comparison with the, the basking sharks. So this is one of the treasures of Ackle. It wasn't always looked after because there was unsustainable exploitation after the Second World War for the liver of the sharks, which was used in oil lamps and, and heating, and thankfully that practice discontinued and the sharks are fully protected today. You also have the bottlenose dolphins that frequently come around the coast, coming into Keem, coming into Kiel, and again, that reflects the richness of the marine environment on Ackle. There are seabirds, not only the gannet, but you get a whole rich variety of other seabirds that are using these waters. The bird on the top right is the fulmer. You get them nesting on the cliffs at Minon, on Inish Galoon, off uh, Pertine, and around the coast. There's another beautiful little bird, the black guillemot. It's like a small little pigeon, black and white pigeon, on the water, and they nest in the cliffs. But Ackle doesn't have big seabird nesting colonies. The waters are very rich in terms of feeding. You have to go offshore to the Bills Rocks, 10 kilometers offshore from Moitog Head, and there is a major seabird nesting colony for this beautiful little bird, the puffin, and there are other seabirds, such as the storm petrel. This is a designated area under Natura 2000 as well. So there is an extraordinary marine, rich marine life around Ackle Island, and I think we should be aware of that. The largest Natura 2000 area on land extends from Ackle Head right all the way to Dugart and embraces the two great mountains that we have on the island, Schlieve Moor and Crohan. And this embraces a whole variety of different habitats from the blanket bogs up to different heathland types right onto the mountain top. So there is an extraordinary richness of, of habitats and probably one of the most wonderful, precious parts of Ackle Island is the northern face between Schlieve Moor and Saddle Head. It's the area of Anna, which is very few people actually probably visit, but it is one of the wilder parts of the island. And um, it really is a, is a treasure. You can see the Corrie Lake there at Loch Nikiroga. This is an area where you have ravens, you have the peregrine falcon, and it once was a place where two species of eagles, the white-tailed eagle and the golden eagle, would have reigned. Sadly, they were exterminated through persecution, and I think the last golden eagle was found in the early part of the 20th century. 
They have been seen. I think, John, you've seen go, uh, Golden Eagle back. Um, I still search for them in hope. They are returning to Ireland. They have been reintroduced uh, in Killarney and up in Donegal. And it's only a matter of time, I expect, that they will be back bracing those cliffs because there's something missing in terms of the fact that we don't have eagles on Ackle Island. Looked from the summit of Schlieve Moor, you get this sense of the actual exposed bare, bareness of the landscape. It's not about grazing. In this case, it's about the sheer force of, of actually nature. And this is one of the most important identified areas for bryophytes, these mosses and lichens. It's one of the three most important areas in Ireland for these actual um, uh, rare plants. Looking up from the deserted village, which would have been a familiar landscape for Heinrich Bull, you can see in late summer, you can see that it's a richness of heather, the different types of heather, and of course that is home to different species, most notably the skylark, but also a whole range of other plants and animals. This little bee on the right-hand side was one that I came across last summer. It's called the heather coletes. It's a solitary bee, and I discovered it at several places on the island. It had not been seen here since 1913. So that shows that there's still a lot of nature that hasn't been discovered on the island, and it only means that people need to get out and obviously explore and discover. Then moving down, you will also find that in the lower reaches, where the deeper peat occurs, there are extensive areas of blanket bog. A lot of it has been worked out in terms of turf exploitation, but you can see here the richness in terms of the bog cotton. The little plant on the top center is the sundew, which is a parasitic plant because there's so few nutrients in these peatlands that the plants actually need other ways in which they get nutrients and this little plant actually feeds on insects, so it derives its nutrients from them. And there are many other species like the bog asphodel, marsh orchids, and of course the sphagnum provides home for species like this common frog. So there's an extraordinary richness and diversity in the landscape, and of course we have to care for it. The next site I will refer to, the next Natural 2000 site, is called Keel Macker Menon Cliffs. And what's extraordinary about this is that you have a whole range of habitats from the beach, the shingle bank, the macare, the sand dunes, right up onto the mountainside in terms of the different heathlands. Um, so this is one of the great assets of, of Ackill. Behind that shingle bank, which stretches for most of Tromor, you have an area of macare. Now that has been transformed. There is a golf course there. There is a lot of grazing, but in the areas of the wetter parts of the Macare, there are rich habitats for mosses, including a rare little liverwort called the petalwort. And of course, the lakes, Keelock and Shruhlbeg, provide a refuge for wintering water birds. Migrant birds like this golden plover actually frequent the Macare on migration. And this little bird in the bottom right hand side is one of the nesting birds, the ringed plover, that nests along those shingle banks. So it's a fragile environment, but it's also a very rich and diverse environment. Moving over to this side of the island, there's a smaller area of Macare, but it's one of the most beautiful parts of Ackle Island. This is formerly called Dugurt Macare Loch Du. It's a special area of conservation, but it's also a special protection area for birds. It's also called the Valley Sandy Banks, and very clearly the local community have made that known that this is the proper name that it should be called, so maybe it should be changed to recognize that. Looking down from Schlieve Moor, you can get that sense of the northeast corner of Ackle, with all its lakes, with the Macker, with the Golden Strand and the Dugard Strand. So that's an extraordinary rich part of, of Ackle. And I was saying, I took this picture last April, I was saying to Sheila McHugh that I could almost see her walking on Dunever Beach in her bare feet. 
so she she felt a little bit um, under under scrutiny, but um, she can rest assured that I hadn't. Um, but you can see here the Mac Air along the 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 area, and that's a very important part of it. Behind it is a wonderful lagoonal area called Shruhal, which actually is a very fine wetland area, and that's a wintering place for many many different types of birds. Not visited by many people, but it's, a, it's an extraordinary rich. Unfortunately, like a lot of the Atlan coastline, particularly around this corner, there's serious erosion taking place. In the 15, 16 years that I've been visiting this area, that bar between the lagoon and the sea is disappearing. So probably it's only a matter of time before the power of erosion, the sea, the more extreme weather events that we're getting will actually change that. And what I'd like to do is just to take you, looking at this corner of Ackville, just to take you through a year as to what you would experience out on the Mac Air and in the lakes. One of the beautiful birds that you can find on Ackville in January is the Whooper Swan. There are Whoopers on Keel Lake, Shrohelbeg, on this, on the keel side of the island, but there's about 50 of them that spend the winter on the Mac Air. They also benefit from having the safety of Loch Namrak and Loch Du, the lakes, where they can seek refuge when they are disturbed and at night. They are faithful to these areas. This bird here down in the center is carrying a leg ring, which I observed in, in, in about seven or eight years ago, and it kept coming back to the area, showing that birds are faithful to their wintering grounds, which makes sense, because if it works and you're fed well, it makes sense to come back to the same restaurant um, on, in, in years. So this is what you would expect to see in January. Around the coastline in winter, because Achill, remember, is on the western fringe of Europe, it has very mild weather compared to, compared to many parts like Germany. So there is a migration of many birds to western Europe. And these little shorebirds, this purple sandpiper, it really does live on the edge. It's right at the edge of the tide, the waves come in, crashing in, and it jumps up, but it's feeding on small little shellfish and other mollusks that are actually around the coast. There's many other waders, but I'd just like to single out the bird on the top right. This is the curlew. These are wintering birds on Ackle nowadays. They come from Scotland, from Scandinavia. And unfortunately, it's a bird that really has dramatically declined in Ireland over the last 30 years. When I went to work in Brussels in the early 1990s, there were 5,000 breeding pairs still in Ireland. Nowadays, there's probably about 100. And it reflects the catastrophic decline that these birds have experienced through all the changes that are taking place in the landscape. It would have been a breeding bird on Ackle in the past. Unfortunately, it's no longer with us. There are conservation efforts being made, but it shows the seriousness that nature is facing. Ackle is an extraordinary place for the otter. If you go around the coast or look on the lakes, quietly, discreetly, there's a very good chance that you will see the otters. Sometimes you will see a female with two cubs or a male patrolling the, the coast. They feed in the marine environment on crabs, but they have to come inshore to wash themselves in fresh water because salt water and the fur doesn't work for them. So it really is one of the riches. I saw two of them on Loch Namrak, quite close to here, yesterday evening. Another bird that you will find around the shoreline from Duniver Strand to the valley and also over at Keel and in Ackle Sound is this beautiful small black and white goose. Mm -hmm. It's called the Brent goose. I spent many years studying this species in Ireland and it brought me to Canada to their breeding grounds in the very high Arctic. And it, I just wanted to show those images that I'd taken on Bathurst Island in the 1980s to convey the sense of the links between Ackle and other parts of the world in terms of the extraordinary migrations that species take. These birds travel 5,000 kilometers back to their breeding grounds. 
They can live for 20 years or more. So you can think of the extraordinary migrations that they take. In summer, they rub shoulders with polar bears and Arctic wolves. So it really, you know, this is, they live in a totally wild, extraordinary places, and yet they come here and depend upon Ackle and other parts around our coast in winter. Another little gem of Ackle is the Irish hair. It's a variation of the mountain hair. It does not go white in winter, as many of its cousins do. It's one of the most ancient mammals that we have, going back 28,000 years. There are remains in Waterford to record that this species has been around for a great length of time. This individual was in its form. I came upon it one day. It was asleep. I woke up, and you can see its reaction was <laughs> one of a little surprise. I didn't disturb it. He just ran off a bit and continued what it was doing. I, all my observations of Ackle Wildlife, I do report them, including to the National Biodiversity Records Centre. Interestingly, when it comes to the hair, when you report the hair, they will not give the geographic reference of your sighting. Because unfortunately, hairs are still subject to people capturing them illegally for coursing. And so it's just, you know, I find I'm all for sustainable use and management, but I really think that there are certain practices in the 21st century that we should not be continuing. In April, you start to see the flowers and all the other wildlife starting to take bloom. And this is one of the very rare moths that can only be found in the western fringe of Scotland and Ireland. It's linked to the macair. It's linked to the sand dune system. It's called the belted beauty. And that's a male on the left. And the extraordinary thing about the life cycle of this species is that the female, you can see it up on the top right, under the male, the female is flightless. So the male flies around, sometimes during the late afternoon, and then obviously searches for the female. They occur at Kiel and also Last year, we discovered him. Kathy Lynchicon from the valley also discovered it was present at uh, the valley sandy banks. And this is its caterpillar, which is depending upon the bird's foot trefoil. So this is one of the rare species that is in Ackle um, and depending upon the macker and the sand dune system. <coughs> I mentioned about the, the decline of the wading birds, these little shorebirds that depend upon open landscapes. And this bird is still here on Ackle. It's called the lapwing. It's the national bird of Ireland. And they are still trying to succeed in nesting in the valley, sandy banks, just in the wet macker area at Loch Dew. There are several pairs. It was once much more abundant over at Kiel and in uh, Loch Dew area, but there's only probably three or four pairs now left. Last year, I watched them and they nested, but unfortunately, they didn't manage to raise one young because they're predators, foxes, crows, and you can see a heron coming in on the breeding territory actually eliminated the possibilities. So the, the habitat, the landscape, is no longer actually suitable because, unfortunately, the pressure of grazing and other things has led to that, and predators have actually taken the young. Into May, you see that there's other migrants. The last of the migrants, this is bird on the top right, is like a small curlew. It's called a whimbrel. In fact, they call it the May bird. They're migrating through on their way to Iceland to nest, and the macare habitat at Kiel and at the valley is really important. They stop off, they refuel as they're heading on the final stage. And this little bird on the right used to be a common nesting bird in the valley and probably elsewhere on Ackle Island. It's called the Dunlin. Unfortunately, they have disappeared as a nesting bird, not only from Ackle, but from many places 
where they nested in the Macker around the western coast. And this is probably going to be the next bird that becomes <coughs> extinct in Ireland as a breeding bird. There's only probably 20 or 30 breeding pairs struggling to survive in Ireland. And it really is a shame that in the 21st century we were talking about such things happening to uh, species like this. Moving on through the summer, late spring, you have the primroses, you have the uh, sea thrift, the sea campion, the ragged robin. These are all the flowers that will actually thrive. They're there in the landscape. And when they're given a chance, they actually will actually uh, blossom. And you can see that along the roadside verges for the primroses. Unfortunately, you don't see them on the macar nowadays because there's too much grazing. And I just want to make that clear that these are only in areas where you will actually have some seizure for a while of grazing to allow the plants and the pollinators. And where you do get those opportunities, you get this extraordinary richness of pollinators. We hear a lot nowadays about the decline of pollinators in Germany, in Ireland, um, and, but yet they still actually survive here in Ackle. On the left you have two of the butterflies, the small tortoise shell and the green hair streak, which would be familiar to people are here on Ackle Island. But there's another relative to the butterflies, the moths, that come out at night. And for every butterfly, there's probably about 10 species of moth here on Ackle. And there's some extraordinary species. Look at this uh, moth here, the emperor moth, which comes out at this time of the year. And it has these wonderful eyes, mimicking eyes of, 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 of uh, a bird. Or, or, and it's a form of it's, it's self-defense that if some predator comes, it flashes, so therefore it's protected. Another one is the elephant hawk moth, which in my garden at Dooniver, I've actually recorded over 200 different types of moths, and I probably have only scratched the surface in terms of what's here on Ackle and in the west of Ireland. There's another fantastic little group of pollinators called hoverflies which again, people are only starting to discover in relation to the richness and diversity of the different plants and animals. Into July, it's feeding time for all the birds that have emerged, including these sand martins um, that are begging, demanding to be fed with all the food that is actually available at Loch Nebrac. Look, also the actual mallard and the mute swans this is when nature is actually at its strongest in terms of expression. And again, where grazing has been managed in terms of the fields behind the macker and in the, in, in the valley, you will see wonderful profusions of pyramid orchids, lady bed straw, this rare plant, the field gentian on the right hand side. And that profusion also provides opportunities for rare butterflies, that dark green, uh, green fertility, and visitors from southern Europe. This is a hummingbird hawk moth, which I saw on, 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 on the, in the valley last summer. And when you spend time in nature, you sometimes come across something really special. And last August, I came across this little bumblebee. It's called the great yellow bumblebee. It's the rarest bumblebee in Ireland. They have dramatically declined, or only on the Macar and sand dune systems on the western fringe. The main area is up in Belmullet, where they still have a healthy population. I saw one of them in the valley last uh, summer. And this is really of high conservation concern. There's a national plan for the recovery of this great yellow bumblebee. So there's hope in that these species are still here, but they are in a very precarious state. There are other endangered pollinators that I came across last summer. On the right is a little bumblebee called the, the large Carder bumblebee, which is also of conservation concern. And you will see them on the red clover and other plants where they get an opportunity to feed. There's another little bee, and this was discovered by a visiting naturalist 
uh, Celia Grobnes. I don't know if she's with us tonight. She'll be here over the weekend. This is called the Northern Coletes. It's another highly threatened species in Ireland that is depending upon the macker, and we discovered them at the valley. So there are really interesting species of wildlife in the area. One of the gems of the wildlife of Ackill Island is the charismatic chuff. It's a beautiful crow that has red bill and legs. And this really, Ackill provides great conditions for them in terms of the cliffs that min on around the island where they can actually nest. And you get up to 70 or 80 of them gathered together on the Macair at the valley in, in late summer. You sometimes in late summer or early autumn into September, October, you see these strange people walking around with binoculars and telescopes, bird watchers, coming to Ackle Island to look for bird migration. And I don't know if you noticed, but this English bird watcher, his name is Josh Jones, is trying to photograph a little bird called the semi-palmated sandpiper. It was so close to him that he, didn't, he couldn't use his proper camera, he was using his phone. And this is the bird, it came all the way from Canada or the United States, it was in the valley, and right beside it was a Siberian bird, a little stint. So here was a classic case of East meets West on Ackle Island. So maybe there's a lesson there through nature that we can actually come together and live in harmony. Moving into autumn, the winter birds, the widgeon, are back on Shrohul, at Shrohul Beg. The diving ducks, the tufted ducks, are on the different lakes around the island. And of course, where you get prey, you get predators. This wonderful, beautiful little bird is called a merlin. It's the smallest of the falcons. They do nest in Ireland. It's a very scarce nesting bird. But they also come to Ireland uh, from Iceland to spend the winter. Again, re reflecting the richness of the, the birds. And we move back more into November in winter. It's the cycle of nature. The whooper swans are back in on the macker. They shared it with some pink-footed geese and some grey-like geese. So it was coming back into the cycle of events. And Ackle gets birds coming during the cold weather period into the um, macker. This is a red wing. It's a thrush that would spend the winter in Europe. And when you get the cold spell, as we had last, uh, last December before Christmas, a lot of these thrushes migrate because they have a better chance of survival on Ackle Island. And the final discovery last year was this strange duck. It's called a white winged duck, which turned up in the valley. It was the first time it was ever seen in Ireland, and it attracted hundreds of bird watchers to Ackle Island. All these crazy people with their cameras and telescopes and uh, binoculars. But it showed if you have interesting wildlife, you attract lots of people. So it is part of the actual ecotourism of potential of the island. So that just gives you a taste of what you will find throughout the year. But I think it wouldn't be fair if I was to say, well, it's all great, we have this extraordinary richness, without also saying that we have big challenges here on Actel as elsewhere. The valley once was grazed by cattle. It was a cattle graze system. But come the 1980s, it switched to sheep. And of course, grazing is part of the management of this landscape. But if you put 500 sheep on a macare, there's not very little, there's very little left for nature. And unfortunately, that is one of the big challenges that is faced, is how you manage and work with farmers to actually ensure that you have a socio-economic grazing system, which also is looking after nature. Some of the birds will benefit from the sheep, those starlings were obviously having a, a little piggyback, but there are too many dead sheep, and that provides food for hooded crows. Predators then eat the breeding waders. So the balance isn't there, and that's, I think, something that needs to be addressed. There's a new arrival on Eckel Island, and 
I honestly, when I saw this, I actually took this picture just off Ackle um, on, on the way to Crom, but they're actually in, on Ackle at different places. And you know, it's extraordinary to see a red deer. It's a beautiful animal, and I think it's great to see them back here, but they do present huge challenges in terms of how you manage it. There are no natural predators of red deer um, on Ackle Island, and I don't think there will be any time soon. <laughs> but, so it does actually raise the question of how we manage the relationship between the um, grazing animals um, in the absence of natural predators. Then there's the issue of burning. It's only a couple of weeks ago when there was a serious fire at the bog between the valley and Bunakuri. That bog is a protected area under national legislation. And it caused, these fires cause huge damage to the structure of the ecosystem. They wipe out all the insects, they damage the peat, and it's not really sustainable as a practice. Now, whether that was done deliberately, some people would say these are done by people who want more grazing, or whether it was an accident through carelessness of somebody burning refuse, it still causes too much damage. This fire here took place a few years ago, just above the Heinrich Bold cottage. So you might have actually had to go out and see the ashes of Heinrich Bold's cottage, because it's not only a risk to nature, it's a risk to people and to homes. And I think this fire here at Soila, a few years previously, this is something that needs to be managed because the fire brigade had to come out a few weeks ago. Three fire brigades, a helicopter, and obviously people are put at risk. So it's a problem, not only an actal, but it's a problem that we have to address. And unfortunately, not every plant on actal is welcome because there are non-native species that have actually caused a lot of disruption to the ecology. This giant rhubarb is a beautiful plant in Chile, but it's not a native plant on Eccel Island, and unfortunately, it has spread. Prager didn't record it in 1903, so it actually has spread in places, particularly, unfortunately, Duiga, but also at Bonacuri, you can see, particularly when the ground is disturbed, you can see that these plants are causing ecological damage. This is listed on a European regulation for invasive species. So Ireland is legally obliged to do something to actually deal with this problem. You also have the rhododendron, a beautiful plant, but it's everywhere in places, particularly where the, the, this land is abandoned, there's no management of it, and it spreads over the landscape. And where you get rhododendron, you get very little else in terms of nature. And of course, we now have Japanese knotweed along the roadside. You see these signs. And of course, that's another plant that poses problems. So there are challenges in terms of dealing with the nature. And there's another challenge, and it's us. In terms of the fact, I love Ackle Island. I want to roam freely. And I'm really grateful to the farmers and the landowners who allow me to walk over their land. I've never been stopped. I'm respectful of their property. But if Agal Island becomes more popular after the Banshees and all the other movies that are taking place, there's a risk that we may love the place to death in terms of unsustainable tourism. And just to give you an example, since I started coming here, surfing seems to become more popular. And that's brilliant because it's part of the fabric of the economy of the area and it provides opportunities for outdoor recreation. But if you have 12 months of the year surfing on Keel Lock, you don't get the hooper swans anymore. There used to be about 100 hooper swans coming there in October, November. They don't come there anymore. So there has to be a place for people to surf and also for the hooper swans to be able to actually feed and rest after their migrations from Iceland. And dare I say it, there's also the big challenge moving forward is how we deal with the issue of turf 
and the peatlands. Peatlands are one of the most important stores of carbon on the planet, much more than forests, even though they occupy a much smaller part. And there's a tradition, rightly so, of using peat as a for form of heating, domestic heating, on the island. Probably the, one of the greatest controversies that I had to work on in my career in Brussels was to deal with the issue of peat extraction on protected peatlands, particularly in the Midlands. And that's still not fully resolved as an issue. So we need to explore ways in which people, people need to be able to heat their homes. And we need to transition. This is the great challenge. The ambassador talked about renewable energy, wind energy. Um, and we need to find ways in which we transition from using peat that people still have security of heating their homes and that we talk about actually restoring the peatlands on Ackle Island. So, sorry for all that despair, but that's the truth. We have beauty, we have extraordinary nature, but we have a huge amount of pressures. But they're not insurmountable. So I sometimes get a little bit annoyed when I'm on Twitter and I see people describing Ackel as a wasteland or it's destroyed. Yes, there are problems, but they're not irreversible. Through the will, through working with the communities, the landowners, the farmers, a lot of good can be achieved. And there are opportunities there as well. Just to give you one example that has only started, it was officially launched, going back to the EU. I was in Brussels when this project was selected under the LIFE program. LIFE is an extraordinary financial instrument to support nature restoration, particularly in protected areas. So this project, which deals with the Macare habitat, in nine different areas from Donegal down to Galway, including in the valley, is a big opportunity to work with farmers to restore nature in the valley. And it's already starting. I mentioned the lapwing, the breeding lapwing. There's already been a protective exclosure put up in the valley to help the lapwing, to keep the predators out, to let the vegetation grow so it's temporary. It'll be taken away later when the lapwing stop nesting. And there are several pairs of lapwing in there. And let's hope for the first time we'll actually see them successfully nesting and a thriving population reestablished. But this system will only work if it can be combined with the big funds under agriculture. And the agriculture policy is central to how we deal with nature restoration. There's a new scheme, it's called ACRES, that is being set up by the Department of Agriculture with farmers. And the LIFE project in the valley and elsewhere will be combined with this in order to make sure that farmers get paid in terms of their delivery of services. So if a farmer produces food, which they're expected to do, this is really important, but they also provide other services like climate benefits, carbon benefits, and also nature benefits. And I think we should recognize and reward what farmers can do. Of course, doing that in a commonage where you may have 40, 50 or more owners is going to be interesting. There's another big project taking shape in this part of the world, from Donegal down to Galway as well, and that's to try and work towards restoring the blanket bogs. Now, there are many sites in Mayo, but unfortunately the nearest one to Ackle is Loch Gall on the Koran Peninsula. But this again is going to work with farmers to restore nature, paying them for the results that they deliver, and there's going to be a huge body of experience that is transferable to Ackle in terms of restoring peatlands, including dealing with things like rhododendron. So they're building up that expertise, and I think this is another opportunity. That's Dugart East Bog between the valley and Bunnacurry, as it should look like at this time of the year. And finally, just to bring it back into the European context, there is a huge initiative as part of the European Green Deal, and I think there is a serious attempt 
at the European level to work towards a sustainable model, not only on biodiversity, but obviously on climate, but also on the whole food system and on the circular economy. But as part of the biodiversity agenda, the most important European initiative for nature is a proposed nature restoration law that is now being negotiated with the member states and the European Parliament. And for the first time, that will really give a great focus on the challenge of restoring nature. We've lost so much nature in Europe. It will provide opportunities, particularly for things like peatlands, to bring them back to restore. Can you imagine in the future meeting farmers and they say, I am a proud carbon farmer. I'm looking after carbon and I'm getting paid for doing that. That's the model for the future. Not only about producing sheep, but also producing vital services such as carbon farming. And I think this nature restoration law, combined with other initiatives that are now being negotiated at the European level, will, I think, facilitate that debate in terms of helping restore nature. I hope that wasn't too heavy for you on a Friday evening, but I just give you a taste that there is extraordinary richness here on Eckel. There are big challenges, but they are not insurmountable. Thank you.